Today is June the 14th, 2022. My name is Tanya Bicham. I'm with Oklahoma State University, and along with me is Ben Pollard, an Oklahoma Conservation Commission retiree. We're in Geary, Oklahoma, to speak with Debbie Cornott regarding her long career in conservation. Today's interview will be part of our Oklahoma's Conservation Heritage Oral History Project, which is a collaboration between the Oklahoma Conservation Historical Society, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, and the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program. So thank you for talking with us today. And I have it that you were with the Central North Canadian River Conservation District, 1988 through 2008, and then 2008 to roughly 2016, with the Oklahoma uh, Conservation Commission in the Water, Water Quality Division. Yes. And then after that, you came back in and are the director of the Conservation District. So you come full circle. Huh? Yep. Okay. Well, thank you for talking with us today. You're welcome. Before we get into your conservation uh, career, let's learn a little bit about you. Okay. Uh, start wherever you like. Um, I'm 67. I have three children, two boys and a girl. I have seven grandchildren. Um, it's hard to believe that uh, time has gone so fast uh, through these years, but uh, and life is funny because when I first, um, as a kid, was thinking about what I wanted to do in my life, I wanted to be an archaeologist. I don't know where I picked that up at. It's probably some book in the in the grade school library on Tutankhamun or something like that. But that's that was my passion. And to the extent that one day uh, my mother had left her diamond wedding ring by the kitchen sink after she had washed the dishes. And uh, I was probably about eight years old. And uh, I took that diamond ring out into the plowed field in the back of the house and buried it. And uh, I was going to play archaeologist. I had my little spoon and my little ice pick and I was going to do excavation work. And I just knew I could remember where I had put that diamond ring. And after about 15 minutes of starting increasingly frantically looking for that diamond diamond wedding ring, I finally found it. And uh, I took it back in and carefully washed it very well to remove all traces of the dirt that I had um, put on it and replaced it by the kitchen sink. And I, I never did that again. But I, I didn't lose my passion for archaeology. And um, that's, that's what I wanted to do. And, until when my parents told me um, that that wasn't going to happen and I needed to be more realistic. And my mother says, go get a typing, uh, take a typing course. She says, you'll never know when you need to be a secretary. And uh, she was absolutely right. And I took a typing course in, in high school. And um, if it hadn't been for that typing course and uh, everything, I probably would not have gotten my job at the Central North Canadian River Conservation District, which was one of the greatest blessings of my life other than my children. So where did you go to high school? Calumet, Oklahoma. I was 19 in my graduating class. And what year did you graduate? 1973. And what did your parents do for a living? Um, my mother um, did a variety of things. She was a teacher, a perpetual college student, and um, secretarial work. Uh, she taught at a college in Oklahoma City for a while, just, just numerous things. Uh, my dad was always a farmer, and that was during the time when um, farming was starting to have to increase in order to make a living. You know, when I was, when I was in grade school and stuff, every quarter section had a farmhouse on it, and a lot of people could make a, you know, a living off of that quarter section, but as time went on, you started seeing, you know, people having to get more land in order to to make a living. And um, now, you know, you drive through and all those old farmhouses, by and large, are gone that used to be on all those quarter mile sections. You might see an occasional barn still standing, but even those, because of time, have have either fallen in or, or been removed, you know, so. Um, just a sign of the times. My dad worked for the railroad in order also to make ends meet, but he farmed and uh, my grandfather farmed and um, there towards the end, he didn't have any land he owned himself and towards the end of his life. So he rented everything. He had, 
900 acres of cultivated ground, 600 acres of pasture and some cows and that he ran, but he would, um, he worked four to midnight for the railroad and he'd come home, grab some sleep, and then he would get up the next morning and go do the farming until he had to go back to work at the railroad. And um, he had no boys. I was the oldest daughter. My sister is eight years younger than I. So it fell to me, and he took me everywhere. Even as a little kid, he took me with him to check the cattle or to fix fence or to, you know, one of my earliest memories is riding on the tractor with my grandpa. He had... I don't know who made it. They called it the M and it had two little narrow wheels in the front of it and some fenders and this spindle with a platform. And how my mother let me, as a little bitty kid, probably four or five, ride on that tractor with him pulling discs and, but she did. And I remember standing by him on that little platform and he'd have me put my arm around his neck and he'd put his arm around me and until we came to a corner and then I had to put both arms around his neck while he tur turned the wheel, you know, but that's one of my earliest memories, um, uh, riding the tractor with him. And uh, that graduated into when I got into junior high and high school, um, driving a tractor for my dad. So um, one of the farms that um, he rented was um, just almost a quarter of just all cultivated land. So it had nice long, you know, you'd go a half a mile and then go a half a mile and then go half a mile and back. And so that's where he decided to give me my first tractor driving lesson. And I don't know if you're familiar with the Minneapolis Moline GB, but it's um, uh, propane fueled, no cab. Um, in order to see properly, you got to stand up and by the fender all day and, and drive and, um, the heat blows back off of the mm. the engine if you're going into the wind so it could become quite uncomfortable and and the umbrella wasn't really much to speak of um, and when the sun got low it wasn't much use anyway so my first tractor driving lesson he took me out and put me on there and started it up and we started going and he had me do a little bit of the driving and steering and and um, he goes <laughs> He goes, here's the clutch, here's the brake, here's the throttle, here's the kill switch. If you get into trouble, pull this. And he stepped off the tractor. <laughs> and that was, that was the extent of my tractor driving lesson. And uh, so, but I, man I mean, I managed. Uh, it, there was a few interesting escapades with that old tractor because it was very light end on the front. And so if you um, were plowing or something and, and uh, dropped the trip the plow too soon and happened to be going up an incline, uh, the front end had a tendency to start coming up off the ground. So that clutch came in handy a couple of times. But as time went on and he gradually got more land, he hired a hired man. And by that time, he had managed to acquire another tractor that had a cab and air, air conditioning and a cushion seat and all this nice stuff, power steering. And I just knew, I, you know, I was going to, no, the hired man got that. And I had to still go around on the old GB watching the hired man zip past me because that GB didn't go near as fast as that new tractor did. And um, with with him in the a, a, AC blowing on him and, and everything. But I finally eventually graduated up to a John Deere 4440 and thought I was in heaven. That was... Um, by then, my boys had come along, and they'd go with me, and they'd take their pillows, and they'd, they'd even sleep around behind the seat and stuff. They were little enough they could do that. One would ride with my dad when he was out there, and the other one would ride with me. So, you know, it, it's been a long, long time working with uh, my dad and farms and stuff like that. What would you use for sun protection if the umbrella didn't work? At least uh, we didn't have things like that. We had sun in to make our hair, you know, blonder back then. And I, we had um, baby oil and iodine mixed together, you know, when I, to, to tan you. I don't remember, you know, there being like um, SPF stuff back in 
when I in the seventies when I was in high school. That just you confident. wanted to get a lot of sun. You didn't you didn't want to shield yourself from it. So you at least wear a hat. Yeah, I wore a build cap. Okay. You know, I'd wear a build cap. But not long sleeves or anything. No, now my grandpa, my grandpa, he he wore overalls and uh, those khaki work shirts. Mm -hmm. They had the long sleeves and they'd button up. He wore those every day. And when I would come out with him to, to ride, you know, at seven, eight in with him in the tractor, he would, you go get some, you, you go get some clothes on, you know, he would be really concerned because even in July and August, he didn't, I mean, they stayed buttoned up. He cut, he, and he was so dark, you know, so tanned on his face and his hands. And he had the most unusual colored eyes. They weren't blue and they weren't green. They were aqua. And I can still remember his eyes and that tanned face. And then he'd take his cap off and he was just like snow white, you know, from there up. But uh, yeah, um, he, he was ahead of his time, I think, uh, back then uh, when I was little, at least for me anyway. So then I just out of a side here, since you were changing gears, was your first car an automatic car a stick? No, my first car, well, I learned how to drive on a, a stick. on a truck that, you know, a pickup that had the gear shift and all that. And I drove wheat trucks. They all had, okay. you know, the, the gear shift and everything. But my first car was a 1972 Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme and uh, I, with bucket seats and a console. I, I thought I was really something, so. <laughs> okay, so once you graduate from high school, what happens? Um, went to Phillips University for a year and didn't like it and, and really wanted to, to transfer somewhere else, but um, ended up getting married. Um, I was just kind of at loose ends, really, because um, I had thought I had a game plan. And then when my parents told me no archaeology, I was just like, well, what do I do now? You know, um, so I got married. <laughs> and um, Chris came along oh, almost a year after we'd been married, my oldest son, and then uh, Brian two and a half years later, and then Katie seven years after that. I have three redheads. Um, which the doctor even goes, she says, I know redheads that are married to redheads that don't have any redheads. He said, you've got three. And I said, don't know, you know, don't know what to tell you. And, uh, but uh, they've been a, a real joy in my life. And my oldest son is farming the farm now, but did that for a while. Um, I um, trying to think if I had any any jobs, and I honestly don't remember other than being at home with the kids, uh, um, doing any work. I did some secretarial work very briefly for a while when the kids were small and then went back home and stayed, um, took care of the house and them. Um, my husband then and his father bought a grocery store in Calumet and they were working together on that. And so I started working in the grocery store. And one day this lady came in and I was working the register up front and uh, she was all dressed up. And I knew her you know, pretty well. And I said, where are you going today? And she said, oh, there's a, I've got an interview up at Geary for a job. She said, uh, I think it'd be a pretty good one at the conservation district up there. And I said, really? And she said, yeah, she said, it's a secretarial job. And I said, well, good luck. And she left, walked out the door. I hollered back to the back to my sister-in-law. And I said, come up to the front. I said, I'm leaving. I said, I don't know if I'll be back the rest of the day or not. And uh, I went home and changed clothes and came back up, drove up here to the office and uh, got an application and got the job and the rest is history. So. Uh, had you had any experience with conservation practices or anything to even well, know what it was? Yeah, well, I knew what I knew what the terraces were. I knew I knew what waterways were. You know, I I knew all that basic stuff that was prevalent um, in when I was growing up. You didn't see any no-till because nobody even knew what no-till was back then. But terraces and waterways they were a, they were a standard thing. You know, ponds. Um, 
In fact, I didn't even learn until after I started up here that my dad was the first one to put terraces on the farm that we were living on when I was growing up. Um, so to say that I was really intimately familiar and knew all about conservation districts and the work they do and the people that worked in them, no, I didn't. Um, when I came up and, and applied and everything, uh, I knew I would be intrigued. And that just goes to show you how, how funny life is. I had always wanted to be an archeologist, but I ultimately ended up where I should have been all the time. So, um, you know, the work that I've done here, the people I've met, uh, all conservation district people think of the people that they work with as, as family, you know, whether it's from the commission office or whatever. And uh, it's, it's like being part of a, of a bigger family when you go to work for the conservation districts. And the customers, you, you really get fond of and, and really want to help your customers. Um, so they're still in dirt, associated with dirt somehow, archaeology and- Yeah, yeah, it's still, dirt it's dirt. still <laughs> dirt associated. There you go. <laughs> Soil. So, oh, yeah. yeah. I know better than yes. Soil. You're right. Dirt's what you wash off mm. later. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, do you remember your first week or so on the job? My very first day was April 1st, 1988. And so, that's kind of like the, the, the big April Fool's joke on me. You <laughs> see, haha, you ended up, you did, you know, you ended up where you were supposed to be. In, in, all those years, I wouldn't take a million dollars for them. So what were some of the major projects going on at that time um, in the district? Working with NRCS, there was still an NRCS office here then. It, they had not uh, started the consolidation movement. And so there was John Heiss here. He was the district conservationist. And there was Daryl Putman, who was the conservation technician. And I got to tell you, when I first started up here, I carried a legal yellow pad notebook around with me because acronyms just, I mean, you couldn't do a sentence without there being four or five, six acronyms flying around. So I was like, okay, uh, EWP, and what does that mean? And, you know, ACP, what does that mean? GP, what does that mean? Uh, you know, and, and I had just filled out a, a page and more of these acronyms and after about the third day I finally just tossed it because it just kept getting bigger and bigger you know and then there was the form numbers they go go oh go get me blah 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 and I go, okay and uh, so I finally just tossed it and much to my relief I started picking up the lingo and uh, the angst of the acronyms passed after a while but that was one of my most traumatic times. And we got into HEL, which is an acronym for highly erodible land. And of course, we also called it the hell times um, because it was, it was fast and furious. You had to do assessments on all of the land in your, in your area uh, to see if it was highly erodible, you know, the degree, blah, blah, blah. And, and which was important because it, would help make it more eligible for certain programs that you could apply for. In some instances, um, they had so many programs back then that would help farmers uh, accomplish their goals, whether it was maybe one thing or, or a multi-tiered uh, thing of uh, level of conservation work they wanted to do over a period of years. And in some instances, the HEL determination helped them get that. And, um, I would help, uh, once they had made the determination, I would help put, put the HEL plans together and, and highlight the areas and put all the forms and the determinations and everything, you know, together for them. And I don't remember how much there were, but we had HEL, I mean, tons of HEL plans that we ended up getting done. And this was before computer time? What is all? Well, and, and, no, my, when I first started, I used a typewriter uh, with carbons and the whole nine yards. 
And then we started getting the little computers that had the little bitty screens with the green letters on them and, and it would print out in a dot matrix. I think that was the correct term. Um, you know, and as time goes on, I, I probably wouldn't even know. Katie uses a laptop now and I, I had a laptop right before I retired. So, you know, that's how much all the technology and everything had changed. But being raised old school, I always still had made hard copies of everything because I did not trust that that um, thumb drive or the, you know, the computer or whatever to to not fail me at some point. And uh, so I even even then towards the end was still making hard copies of everything. Or did you work closely with the board as the, as the secretary? Yeah. Um, I had a really interesting board when I first started. Um, there was Harvey Bass and Leroy Jameson and um, Bill Leck. Um, gosh, I can't remember. Harvey Bass um, was was quite a quite a gentleman and, and a leader. Um, and when I when I had first started, I had gone back and read all of the old minutes from from the beginning because I wanted to understand, you know, uh, just how all this came to be and the mission and everything. And I was just really blown away by the work that had been done over the years uh, from this district. And I um, went back and looked at all the old photographs and the archives and and. Uh, was um, impressed with the history and, I, and also inspired by the history. Um, as time has gone on, from, from the reading that I've done, it had seemed that maybe the conservation districts, even though they still uh, were the local presence and the local entity and the local representative of the conservation movement in Oklahoma, some of that momentum for for the work through the through the local conservation districts had been kind of superseded in some ways by all the money that that SCS as it was known then the Soil Conservation Service um, was able to get their hands on, and so in those days it was like that the SCS mission and their emphasis was the driving force on what they could offer. Um, and that, I was appreciative of all the money that, that we could get for things like Great Plains uh, programs and contracts and um, long range plan contracts and ACP. Um, but at the same time, I felt like the districts needed to have their own niche. And, and it would become irritating in a way because people would come in and think that you work for NRCS. And I was always pretty quick to point out that no, I, I don't work for NRCS. I work for the Central North Canadian River Conservation District. And uh, so, uh, but I enjoyed working with NRCS. I enjoyed working with John and Daryl. So. And Let's back up then. What what encompasses the district? What counties are? What's the territory? There's about 300 today. There's about 376,000 acres, I believe, in the in the conservation district area that that is remaining, and it's roughly the western half of Canadian County and the southern half of Blaine County. And the reason, and it, Geary is not a county seat. But this was the original district at that time when it was first formed and in later years ceded land to Canadian County so that they could form a, a district later after the, CN, the CNCRCD was formed and also Blaine County uh, at a later time, uh, which left us with, with what we now have today. And I think a lot of that had to do with, uh, there was a CCC camp here called Camp Lion so there was already a conservation workforce stationed in Geary um, that just made it kind of a no-brainer 
to establish a conservation district here. And, and I don't know where the next closest CCC camp is or was, um, but I know that this one was here. Um, and I think a, a lot of those people that had worked for the CCC then, then came over uh, and started working for NRCS. The, this particular, this isn't the original building. Um, that one has long been torn down, I think, and gone. But um, this particular building uh, was built with donations from local, local people, local farmers, and built by the local farmers themselves. They built this building because they believed in, in the work. And when you go back and read in the old minutes and you read about they had road graders for helping to build terraces and they had this and that. I, I'm just, I'm blown away by the, by the dedication of uh, the mission that they were on to get this conservation on the ground by those early directors and employees. Was it unusual for a district not to be just within a camp, one county? You know, I honestly don't know. I, I looked, I, you know, when you look at back at some of the, some of the early districts and, and I can't call them to mind, some of them have names that are indicative that they were not set up on county lines. Some of them kind of seem to indicate they might have been set up on county lines. I think it was wherever the interest was and maybe where another CCC camp was, uh, wherever the greatest need was that that was the impetus beside, behind forming some of those very early districts. And then as time went on and the interest grew and they saw the work that was being done and other people wanted to form their own districts that that kind of shifted and, and uh, became maybe on a county line. Um, I think some of the very first uh, thoughts were to, to form along a watershed lines, yeah. uh, which is a pretty common sense thought, you know, because um, if you form along watershed lines and then, then that kind of consolidates the, the concerns, the resource concerns you might have within that watershed. And I think part of that may have been applicable here too, because you know, the North and South Canadian River are a pretty big obstacle and, and were back then. There weren't that many bridges uh, spanning the North Canadian River and, and, and there's not that many even today. Um, there's there's one between uh, Gary and Watonga, there's one between Calumet and Gary, and there's one um, north of Calumet. And then you have to go, um, let's see, there's one between Calumet and El Reno, and then there's one north of El Reno. So even today, there's not a lot of ways to get across. And so accessibility for, for service and uh, everything probably also played a consideration into, and I'm sure it was like that in other areas too, you know. Well, and you had mentioned earlier that there was a consolidation that occurred. Um, a, consoli a consolidation with NRCS. You talking about when they pulled out or when they? Yeah. 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 That was a traumatic time. Um, I was I was disturbed and upset for several reasons. Number one. Um, just because of the history of this place and the work they had done and everything, I thought they should have been granted greater respect, you know. Um, but the other really strong concern I had was that a precedent was being set. Um, and when you looked at a lot of the, the work amount that we did compared to districts that weren't being, um, where NRCS was pulling out, our workload was larger and the work that we put on the ground was larger than some of the offices that they were keeping in place. And I think the term started 
for offices like this where NRCS pulled out, they started being called quiet presence offices. And I thought, you know, that really just kind of sums it all up for them in a way, you know? And uh, so we, we couldn't hardly get them to change that. You know, it, they were referred to as quiet present offices where there was no NRCS office. Even though there was still a district board here and, and work being done in the office. And when all that started happening and um, they transferred, um, well, Daryl had gone to work for the commission office, I think, by that time, or made that transition at that time. And he went to work for the water quality office and started working on wetlands. He was the technician that was here. Um, John, they just, transferred you know and said well you report here or you report there and for a while none of them really had a home you know that uh, that for a workplace because it, they would just go where they were needed you know at, within a driving distance and um, i tried to get nrcs to let me schedule our local producers on one day and stack the appointments so that NRCS would still be coming in here and having a presence and meet with our local producers in our local office. Well, that didn't go. Uh, the technicians were a lot better about meeting producers in the office and uh, coming into the office and utilizing, especially the maps and things we have. We have maps going back, aerial maps going back to Oh gosh, I don't know. As the early 30s, I think. And um, in a lot of cases, those old maps are very instrumental. And when you, especially when you get around the rivers or you're looking at something that a creek is causing a problem in, the changes in, in channel change or um, creek change over time. Uh, so they would come in and I would pull maps for them. And so they were really good about keeping the the district on their on their radar and, and meeting the producers here um, but over time even though I and I took applications I mean I knew all the programs uh, that were available uh, I had all the maps uh, for a while and um, so you know producers could still come in here and I would take their applications and highlight on the map the area of concern and everything and forwarded on to the appropriate NRCS office. But as time went on, our maps became, as they did their flyovers, more obsolete. And so that didn't work as well because the maps I had were not the maps that they were needing at that time. Because by that time, we, we, we could print them out, you know, and have them. Um, and they were updated periodically with new flyovers, you know, so and they weren't shared with their office. One DC did, the other DC didn't. But you know, the Canadian County line comes right up to the east side of Gary. And some of the people may farm land in Blaine County um, and farm land in Canadian County, but they'd have to drive to El Reno you know, for their service and then turn around and drive to Watonga for their Blaine County part. Um, whereas they could have just come here, you know, <laughs> it just didn't really make a lot of sense to me. But I mean, I understood the theory behind it. It was it was um, called the, the service center, the USDA service center, because you had FSA in there and you had NRCS. And, and of course you all had um, the conservation districts too but yeah it was a traumatic time and especially for a district that owned their own building because um you know these buildings they take maintenance and upkeep and uh, new roofs uh, you can tell we paint regularly um, and the money that the state provides um, will not cover all of that district building maintenance. I mean, it'll it'll pay for stamps and, and our employees' salaries and stuff like that. And um, maybe, maybe you might explain that 
NRCS paid rent. Yeah, I was, yeah, yeah, I was getting there. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, so um, when they pulled out, they paid rent for their employees' workspace. They had a little formula on how much workspace they needed, and they paid so much per square foot for that workspace. And so it helped a lot of districts, you know, um, with with their overhead. But then when NRCS pulled out, you lost you lost that rent. And so it fell on to the districts to support all that. And we had an equipment program that helped offset that for quite some time. But you know, you don't want to make that, you don't want to gouge your, your customers. Um, so you don't make the rental of that equipment so high that they don't want to rent your, you know, your equipment. But at the same time, you've got to make a little money and it becomes a fine line of charging enough to pay for the upkeep and maintenance of the equipment and the district owned building and still making it affordable for the customers. Well, generally what happens is, in, the, in our case, is it's, a, it's enough to keep the doors open, but not to keep the equipment up. So over time, you know, we've lost pieces of equipment due to just not being able to afford to pay for a whole row of new discs or cutters or, you know, whatever that piece of equipment happened to be. So it, it's it's an increasingly difficult challenge. Yeah, and it was a disadvantage to the farmer. They'd have to. Yeah, because like uh, um, some districts have no equipment. None. That would have been in the 90s when all that was. Yeah, uh, yeah. mid 90s. And when you look today, they've consolidated even further. Yeah. And when the first consolidation happened and they pulled out of the quiet present, non-county seated, located cons conservation districts, um, I started looking around at other states to see what was happening. And I noticed that other states had already gone to a multi-county hub sort of situation. And that worried me greatly because I thought, well, the precedent's been set. Admittedly, it took many years longer than I thought it would for Oklahoma to get there. I thought probably within 10 years, we would be in a multi-county hub, but it's taken 20 and now we're in a multi-county hub. So, you know, you talk to the technicians and you say, how's it going? Oh, I get a lot of windshield time. You know, that's not, how many customers can you service? You know, when you get, your day is primarily spent just trying to get there. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of, a lot of sense to me. So on a, on a typical day now, I mean, people would come through your door. Um, before consolidation or after consolidation? Both to do some comparison. Oh, I don't I, we would be, especially during sign-up period, because that's kind of an ebb and flow kind of thing. When there's sign-up period, you would have quite a few people in and out. Um, when there's no sign-up period, you would have the odd one, you know, come in and out. Now, I'm calling all the time, because sometimes you would just schedule that on site rather than coming in through the door, which the technicians did all the time, generally. And then sometimes they might come back to the office and you know be showing something on the aerial that the technician would be trying to make a point about. Um, and then when they had to sign their contracts, but sometimes that even happened in the field. Um, post, it just gradually kept dropping off. Um, now, when we have our state cost share sign up, I think there's quite a bit of traffic, you know, in and out because we always seem to have plenty of applications. Uh, but even today with consolidation and the, and the budget the way it is, Katie can't be here every day. She splits her time between this conservation district and the Blaine County Conservation District. So she's here some days and and then at Watonga the other days because, you know, I uh, at the bottom when when at the at, when I work for the district and then uh, I put. America's good fortune can't last longer than her natural resources, resources, which is a quote by Mark Twain. And that, 
I think that's true. I mean, it's the backbone of everything this country's built on is, is our natural resources. One of the other slogans for here was something about soil. You save the soil and the soil will save you. Yeah. 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 There's a picture in there of the original conservation district office and it's it's pla that's plastered with all across the length of that building. You save the soil and the soil will save you. Yeah. That's, that's still true, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So were you secretary out the entire time you were? Yeah, I did get a, a promotion to programs coordinator um, okay. there. And, um, you know, how I ended up with the commission in the water quality division was there's a thing that every district secretary has to do about every four or five years, I think, and it's the long range plan. And, you know, most people go, long range plan. And, and some people just change the dates on it. You know, uh, I shouldn't be telling that, but, um, they may tweak it a little bit, but when NRCS pulled out, I, I really thought that it was extremely important that the offices like this one remain relevant. And so when the long range plan gave, came along and I was looking at it, I really started digging into it. And I had been very fortunate with the board that encouraged my education through the years. I mean, anything that was offered, whether it was um, a project wet or a project wild or a blue thumb training on stream monitoring, um, grass ID, grazing workshops, I mean, you name it, if, if, I, if I was interested in it, the board said I would go. Now, sometimes I had to pay for it myself, which was fine. but. Um, I took every education opportunity I, I could and learned a lot. And I got, I had always loved the North Canadian River anyway. I rode horses on it in high school, swam in it in high school. Um, it was just always in the background of my growing up. And so when the long range plan came along and I started into the research for the water quality portion of our district and started finding, um, results on different bodies of water and rivers and stuff uh, from the EQ and other other agencies. Um, it, it, tripped a, it tripped a trigger in me. And what I was finding in doing the research was that it was um, severely impaired and, and listed on the 303D list, which for impaired water bodies of the United States. And, so I, I included that in this long range plan and put in there that um, the goal would be to try to unite the conservation districts from Canton Dam to Lake Overholzer in a united e effort to obtain funding to address these issues. Um, because, you know, not only was it my favorite river, it was, um, Oklahoma City's drinking water source, which I thought one of Oklahoma City's drinking water source, and the recharge source for towns like Calumet, Gary, you know, back then the wells used to be a lot closer to the river than some of them are today. But um, so I, I thought that gave it an extra edge, you know, that hey, you know, this river has some problems and you're drinking its water. And so I put that together and turn the long range plan in and let that kind of rock along a while. And, and the board passed, you know, passed the long range plan with all of that outline in it. And um, lo and behold, I turned up one day and on the agenda item, I put request for funding for North Canadian River Project. <laughs> and uh, one of the board members goes, where the hell's that come from? And I said, the long range plan. And, I had a board member on the board that time named Gene Peters. He says, don't you read the damn thing? You know, <laughs> and one of another one goes, apparently not. And uh, so anyway, uh, they ended up passing it. We submitted, we submitted the proposal and uh, OCC approved it and submitted it for funding. And we were off and running. And the, the districts involved, Dewey County, Blaine County, East Canadian, they all, they all you know, before we submitted the pro, uh, the proposal, 
we had got gone and asked them if they would agree and they did. And so we had this joint proposal between all the districts from Ken to Overholzer. We started out with a little over 300,000. Um, and Monty Ramming, I, I went to work then for, uh, and that had never been my intention. I was, I was pleased that I was offered to, or they offered to hire me for, for that position. Um, but Monty Ramming came in as a planner and I came in as, as a education coordinator and, and a kind of outreach person and stuff. Um, but we started out with 300,000 and we had things in there that people said, nobody's ever gonna, now nobody's ever gonna do that. And so when we were working on how we were gonna cost share some of this, I, um, for example, repair and area exclusion, well, that was unheard of around here. And that's where you, you build a fence so far outside of a, of a creek or a river area or something like that to exclude livestock from getting into it. We said, nobody's gonna do that. Absolutely not, they're not gonna do that. And I said, well, I said, we'll pay for the fence. And they said, yes. And I said, I also think we need to pay them a, a rental amount for the land they're excluding every year. And I argue that you're asking them to reduce their herd size by taking, you know, a certain amount of their acreage out. So I think it's only fair if we're asking them to reduce their herd size for us to pay an annual rental payment on what they're excluding. And they agreed to that. We did that. And um, we ended up putting in, I've got the figures here somewhere, but we ended up putting in a lot of repairing and area fencing. We ended up putting in more no-till. I think it was over 47,000 acres of no-till uh, through, through the area that uh, people said, you won't get anybody. But we did, we did a lot of workshops. I brought people in. I even brought um, a producer down, gosh, where was it from? In some state up north that was a very successful no-tiller um, to talk to people. We did, we did tours. We went out, we did grazing management uh, tours. We did, we put in a lot of fencing for rotational grazing and, and central watering hubs. We did septic systems. Um, we removed um, cedars because cedars take so much groundwater, you know, and that was something that uh, kind of had to fight for, for that particular program the way it was, but, but we got it done. Now I couldn't, I never could get anybody to do uh, a cost share on taking cedars out of a creek itself because the the banks and it just is, it's very, you almost have to go in and hand log them out, which is labor intensive. I never, never could get, I figured that was in a whole category by itself, but I never could get that, that one done. Uh, but you know, just, just the coverage of the cedars itself can just blanket and there's just nothing growing underneath, which contributes to erosion, not to mention the groundwater it saps. Um, gosh, what else? Grass planting. Uh, I just, those are kind of the highlights of what it is. And to make a long story short, through a combination of, of uh, state money and um, federal money through the EPA, we ended up putting, I want to say over three, 350, I'd have to look. So for 3.5, I think 3.5 million mm -hmm. into it by the time by Those were several years, though. Yeah, I mean, it, it took a while. And uh, I think it was in 2016 that they delisted and took the North Canadian off the 303D list. And so far, every time I talk to Shannon, it's still kind of maintaining. Now, what what a lot of people don't say is, is as, and, and that's how we promoted it, too, was that the farmers were being proactive you know, to address whatever contributions, if any, they were making to the river system. Uh, but if you look at monitoring stations as you go down, the closer you get to Oklahoma City, 
the the higher the stuff coming into it um, and that's just from a variety of factors I had uh, somebody in a workshop I was given one time um, that was urban and they were talking about all the all the cattle and everything and being in the river and, and I said do you have a dog and they said yeah we got three dogs I said do you keep them in your backyard? And they go, yeah. And I said, do you go out and pick their poop up every day? And they go, well, no, you know. And I said, does it rain where you live? They said, well, yeah. I said, do you have a storm drain out in front of your house? I said, they said, well, yeah. I said, what about your neighbors? Do they have dogs? And, you know, well, yeah. And I said, that storm drain goes right to the closest creek. So I said, yeah, you may not have a cow out there, but I said, you still have an animal contributing, you know, to the problems that are going on in that river, you know? And I said, if you start thinking in your housing development, how many people have pets that may or may not, you know, you go out, you go out there and you mow your lawn and poof, there goes, you know, it's, I said, it, it's a cute, it's as cumulative an effect as, as, you know, anything else. So, um, we did a lot of education, talked to a lot of groups. Um, that was when you were doing river runs through it. The river runs through it. Yeah. That was the teacher's tour. Mm. And, um, um, I had a lot of fun planning that. I, I really enjoyed it because I love history anyway. And so um, we started out at Beaver, Oklahoma. We tried to keep it small. Um, we invited educators. I went around to schools to promote it, showed them my little traveling slideshow. Um, and we started out up there and we had stops all along the way so that we could show them what a watershed was what happens in a watershed, activities, how that river changes from the time it leaves and is called the Beaver River to the time it gets down and is changes into the North Canadian River. I gave them um, the history that has happened in this watershed over time from Native Americans to maybe, you know, early conquistadors um, passing through the panhandle portion, you know, and French trappers and Calvary and I, have, I always mispronounce that, but you know, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, just, just tons of stuff. We gave them notebooks. We gave them, uh, resource materials. We just everything that we could think of and they loved it. We traveled on a bus and, um, got a lot of good reviews on that, on that, um, teachers, Teacher's Educational Tour of the North Canadian River. A river mm -hmm. runs through it. Yeah. I think there's slides um, on online that, that you can look up and see. So have you been swimming back? Have you been swimming back in your... I've been back... Well, you know, actually, when my kids were young, uh, my husband and I had divorced by, by then, and I was raising three kids myself and had this job and it was like, like I said, it was such a blessing raising three kids. Um, but I lived in a house actually, uh, just about 400 foot from the bank of the North Canadian river, uh, while I was still secretary here and before I went to work for the water quality and, um, really for two boys. Now one boy wasn't as crazy about it. My oldest boy, he was always out there noodling. He was always out there fishing, you know, taking his little BB gun out there, um, mushroom hunting in the spring. My daughter, you know, liked it. She she waited. She was a nature nut, you know. My build my, my build boy was always, can you take me to town? But the other two, <laughs> <laughs> the other two really liked it, you know. Um, so it and it was it was good. And I lived out there for quite a while. Um, now. There was a couple of drastic floods where it wasn't as as thrilling. I mean, it was thrilling, but I wasn't as thrilled to be there at that time. But yeah, there was some really 
significant floods and living that close to the river. Um, I've seen that river over a mile wide when it get out of its banks. In fact, I had a, at one time I had a helicopter hovering over me and they called me and they go, do you want us to rescue? <laughs> do you want us to airlift you out? You know, it was that because I couldn't get out. The water had come up and, um, I said, no, nah, I think I'll be okay. And we always were, you know, but, um, the, um, the guy that had rented the farm, rented me that house for $150 a month. He said, I don't want much. He said, I just need enough to cover, um, renting the farm basically. And um, he ended up being Scott Hoare, the equipment manager up at Blaine County. He wasn't at that time, but um, I've thanked him several times since then because I said, I could not have had a place to live um, with three kids at that time for that amount of rent. And it was a three bedroom, you know, house. So it worked, brick house, it worked out well. Um, I did eventually have to move when he quit um, renting that farm and another guy rented it and wanted the house. So then I had to move, that's when I moved to Calumet. But um, yeah. It, uh, Debbie, before you leave the water quality project on the North Canadian, I think it'd be good to talk about how this was one really good way to connect the city of Oklahoma City and urban folks with practices in a watershed, that there is a connection yeah. there. And that I know from a state level, we try, it's hard to talk conservation sometimes to urban folks, but this was one that was something that was really visible and they could understand. Yeah. Um, I, I hope, I hope, I, I wanted to do more on that because uh, at, at that time they were they were starting to plan a lot of the development uh, for their water park areas and and all of that and mm -hmm. and I don't know if you've ever been to um, Memphis and seen and gone to Mud Island in Memphis but there's a there's a uh, watershed in concrete of the Mississippi River with its tributaries and stuff um, and they flow water through it and it's it's really cool and i wanted them to incorporate something like that in their planning development for this water being concentrated deal that the north canadian river was going to play such an integral part in mm -hmm. because they were using it as the you know the water for the development of all these great ideas and to put signage along the way uh, through that, pointing out different communities and then signage with, with water quality home management tips for both, you know, urban and, and also what what the ag people had done, you know, in order to, to make that possible. Um, but I never could get, I never could get anybody uh, to buy into it. And uh, if you're ever in Memphis, go to Mud Island and see that because it is pretty cool to see and I just I figured the North Canadian would fit, fit in and the North Canadian is such a unique watershed um, for one thing it's narrow very narrow which was one of the reasons I think why our project was so um, effective you know um, in some places it's not more than four or five miles wide. Mm -hmm. The other aspect of the watershed that is so unique, and Greg Scott pointed me at, pointed this out to me years ago, and you know, I'd been driving over the watershed divides. I knew where the Cimarron River started. I knew where the South Canadian River watershed divide started. Um, but I had never realized that the elevation of the riverbed of the North Canadian River is up here and the South Canadian is down here and the Cimarron is down here. I mean, I've driven off mm. the hill north of Calumet down into the Cimarron, never thought a thing about it until Greg Scott pointed that out to me one day. He said, you do realize, don't you? He was out here, we were 
going out to somebody's uh, house for a consultation and and uh, he said you do realize that the north canadian just runs right down through the middle of a ridge don't you i said what are you talking about and he said it sits up here the river runs right through it and it and it angles and uh, South Canadian Cimarron sits down here. And it's as plain as day if you if you if you go look and you think, of course it does. Mm. And it's it's a that makes it extremely unique. Um, and his theory was that he thought that the North Canadian was probably the most ancient ancestral of those rivers. But that over time due to due to uplift weather changes, different things like that, that the other rivers had gradually stolen drainage area away from it through erosion and other things. Um, but yeah, I, I thought that was, that was, it's like its own unique little, little universe up sitting up there on that ridge. EPA helped fund that ride. EPA, yeah, yeah. Uh, a big bulk of the money came from state too and of course the producers had to put in a cost share amount also you know we didn't cover 100 percent they had to you know they had to pay their percentage as well but that when non-point source non-point source pollution did you have any blowback for producers when they found out that it was epa money initially uh, initially there was some some concern, I'll put it that way. Um, but, you know, you talk to them and say, hey, we're going to cost share you X amount of percentage on this practice. Um, yeah, but they'll know, they'll know where I'm at, you know. <laughs> it's like, they probably would figure that out anyway, you know. Uh, one of the biggest problems I had with that program on people being concerned about it being EPA was the, the uh, cost share to eliminate gray water and put it all into a septic system. Mm. They just knew that the EPA, once they had found out they had been discharging gray, you know, their gray water out, was going to come and, and find them and, and, you know, and I said, no, but we did end up, I think, replacing about 17 or 18 uh, septic systems uh, before the project was over over and done, which is better than none, but I had really hoped for a lot more. And how about working with NRCS employees? What was their perception of having EPA come in with money to cost share conservation practices? You know, I don't, I didn't, I didn't really notice a lot, and it may have been because I really didn't care what they thought. Um, it was money that was available. It was money for specific projects. In some cases, stuff that they could not do at the level that we could do. Um, and the goal was, was to get it on the ground, you know. Um, now, in some cases, we could piggyback certain NRCS programs with, with what we were doing, which make it, made it even more enticing for producers. Um, that wasn't always the case, but in some cases it could be done. Um, but um, yeah, um, the goal was to get the work on the ground, not, not worry turf. about turf. Yeah. Good. Those who, who might not know, you mentioned gray water. Oh, gray water. Um, all the bathroom waste, like from the toilet and stuff, uh, would normally have a have a go into the septic system um, in a rural house. Uh, now, gray water and stuff like that that comes out of your washer or your bathtub or stuff like that would be discharged directly out into maybe a ditch or a pasture or something like that. And so that's uh, the detergents and things that are in gray water can contribute to nutrient overloading. So um, 
we would cost share on bringing those up to date and in, in, into proper standards. Terminology. <laughs> <laughs> acronyms, acronyms. <laughs> well, you have seen a lot in your time too uh, in the transition before they've added more women into the into the business. Yeah, that they were just starting to hire a few women um, when um, within our CS or SCS back then, you didn't see very many women. Uh, one of the first women um, professionals with uh, SCS that I knew of was a range specialist. Uh, and uh, I would have her come to, uh, she was very knowledgeable. I'd have her come to some of the early workshops I would do. Uh, DCs were after that. Mostly they were like, um, like the range specialist I mentioned or, or some other kind of specialist. Um, I can't even, I'm not sure I even remember the first DC. There was a few women soil cons coming on, um, soil conservationists coming on there um, later on, but yeah, there weren't that many. Um, it's always interesting being in the first woman into a, a male dominated profession. I, uh, when I was in, in college, I after I left Phillips, I was in class at Redlands Junior College there before I got married. And um, I took a job uh, at Fort Reno Ag Research Station there just on the outside of, of uh, El Reno. And I was the first woman that they'd ever hired in their agronomy lab. And uh, that was kind of interesting because my first job was they took me into this little bitty room and those ceilings were as tall as the ceilings in here. And it was a little bitty like cubby hole room. And um, it was filled from in, in like bookcase rows from desk level all the way up to the ceiling wrapped around like that with little bags of desiccated sheep pellets. And my job was to grind those up all day. <laughs> So they could be um, analyzed for uh, protein content because what they would do is they would feed them different feeds and then based on the results from the end product, determine amount of refuge, amount of potential protein. I mean, all this other stuff uh, from the tests they would run on these ground up desiccated sheep pill. And uh, I, I got my, I, I finally won my spurs and moved out of the the sheep pellet closet in the, into the lab proper. But uh, yeah, that was that was an interesting interesting episode. It's interesting that they decided to put a woman in to do the, to do that job. Oh well, the, the two guys uh, and we. I, I mean, honestly, they had seniority over me. They'd been there, you know, quite a while. Hey, if we've got a newbie coming in, do you want to go in and grind sheep pellets? No, let's let the new girl do it, you know? So. <laughs> but I did get involved in some other really interested, interesting studies after that. that uh, we, had a, we had a fistulated steer out there, uh, which is a, a steer that has a, they, they make a hole in the side in the, of the room and then they put a stopper in that. So when we, grind up all of these different forages to do analysis on them for protein content, roughage, all this other kind of stuff. Um, you go out and you get some of this rumen fluid and you bring it in and you put it in with the sample and then you, you put it in the incubator for a certain amount of time and, and then that, that'll help show digestibility and what actually happens in a cow's stomach to this particular forage that you're trying to analyze to see if it's beneficial or not. And uh, the first time they took me out, the steer's name was Dwight, and he was named after a former um, superintendent at Fort Reno that nobody really liked that much. And the first time they took me out to show me how to get the sample from Dwight, they lined me up right in front of that cannula. And uh, 
took the stopper off and was showing me and I could tell that like something was up and so finally they you know we got the sample and everything well I turned around and they put the stopper back in I turned around and you could see the outline of people on the wall behind you because if Dwight sneezed or coughed or did anything that rumen fluid blew out of that like a like a cannon <laughs> and uh, so they were really kind of hoping that I would get baptized by Dwight with with rumen fluid you know but it, it never happened never happened I did kind of put my foot in it one time because Dwight had moved on and I can't remember his last name and uh, there was one weekend that everybody was going on vacation nobody was going to be around to come over and feed Dwight and so I lived fairly close by then and we had just gotten married and, and I think we I lived about a mile and a half away from from the headquarters where Dwight was at Fort Reno and and so I said I'll, I'll feed Dwight don't worry about it I'll come over and take care of him and they said, well, okay, well, somebody needs to let, and I cannot remember that superintendent's name anymore. But anyway, well, I'll go let Dr. So-and-so know that Dwight's taken care of because this had been one of his concerns. So I go beep off and into his office and, and I go, doctor, I said, don't, you don't have to worry about Dwight anymore. I'll, I'll come over and take care of him and feed him and uh, go back to the lab. About 20 minutes later, we had double doors, swinging double doors that come in to the lab and the doors go boom like that. And then comes the doctor, the superintendent. He goes, who told her to come up to my office and say that Dwight was gonna be taken care of this weekend? And you know, everybody started kind of, and come to find out it was Dwight that he was talking to that was sitting in the chair that had come back to visit <laughs> on that particular day at that particular moment when I went up to tell him that Dwight was going to be taken care of that weekend. So, yeah, that, that, that didn't go over too well. <laughs> we were talking about workshops earlier, not to change the subject so drastically, but one of the favorite workshops that we did, and I did this even after, the, after the, we started the, the North Canadian, was the pond workshop. And I would target a different area of the district every year and uh, invite, personally invite landowners that I knew had nice ponds and, and everything to come in. And we would, I brought a biologist from Stillwater down and he would give a presentation on water quality and practices that helped improve water quality and, and everything. And then we would go out to their ponds and he would sane them and bring up all the fish and based on what that saying brought in he could tell them pretty accurately he i mean he, he he'd say you're only catching about one pounders out of these consistently aren't you and they go well yeah well and he could tell them why that was and how that what they could do to improve and get their fish to grow larger based on just the management of the populations of fish in that in that pond and then we would feed them a fish fry dinner and, and everybody went home happy. Um, but they loved that workshop. When, when that Sane Hall came up, everybody, I mean, would just, they were just fascinated by what that was going to show. And I felt so sorry for the one person that we went out to their pond and, and it was like tadpoles. I mean, just nothing hardly but tadpoles, big bullfrog tadpoles and very few fish and uh, I felt so he was so embarrassed because we'd been hauling up you know all these wriggling fish all day and then we come to his and it's tadpoles but that was one workshop that everybody really enjoyed a lot that's dessert mm. <laughs> yeah well we were talking about women earlier has there been a woman on the board here before you I don't think so I think I'm the first woman yeah the first woman on the board. I always used to threaten them when I was district secretary that I would come back. I said, you guys are going to regret some of this stuff. I said, I will be back. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. But yeah, that was one of the first things I wanted to do as soon as there was an opening, was get on the board. 
Did she have any trouble succeeding at getting on it the first time around? No. Around? No. They tolerate me. <laughs> but that could be because you've worked here and you know that you know that Yeah, I've seen some territory and the ins and outs and such. Well and I, I you know, I've seen board members come and go, worked under some of them, you know. Um either through being the district secretary or the programs coordinator or working for the water quality division, you know. And some of them I grew up with, you know, so. Are you, so that, I'm assuming you're the first female director. For mm -hmm. the board, I mean. As far as I know, yeah. I, I don't remember seeing any other, even reading back through the minutes, I don't remember. Everybody's called a director, though, aren't they? Directors, members board the members, directors. Yeah. Is there one that's in charge? Yeah, there's a, there's a, that's Aaron Bass, which is the um, grandson of Harvey Bass, one of the gentlemen that originally hired me. So, and he's the chairman today. So has there been, a, have, have you been the chairman? Chair, no. Chairperson yet? No, I'm secretary treasurer. Maybe, maybe before you completely retire, you can get up to that. Possibly. <laughs> what prompted, we'll see. What yeah. prompted you to come back and do that after you retired from us? Because I told them I would. <laughs> I said, I'll be back. <laughs> no, and I, I still have, I mean, I still have thoughts and I still care about the district a lot. Uh, and finished business. Yeah, I mean, I care about its history, its legacy, and, and where it's going to go in the future. So. And it's not a paying you. You come, you donate your time. Yeah. What are some of the current issues going on with, with, the, with the district? Um, I think water will continue to be, in, in, in fact, I was talking to Katie a little bit earlier, the chances of getting another project like the North Canadian project uh, funded for, for district work is probably going to be extremely difficult, even though it is a drinking water source. I think they're going to be looking at smaller watershed area concentrations. And so I was talking to Katie um, this morning when I came in um, that uh, maybe we need to look at maybe writing a letter or asking for information on, on um, Six Mile Creek and possibly some others just look at, to see if, if it could possibly um, be considered for additional funding for an emphasis area um, for work within that watershed. Um, it's it's a tributary. Um, it's it's just tributary to the North Canadian. Um, so, as are a lot of the creeks. Um, so it would still be beneficial for the North Canadian if we could get some additional emphasis areas for tributaries. Is no till st still popular in, in the district? There's still, there's still some no till. You still see it. Um, there's some people around Calumet no tilling that I thought I would never see no tilling. To say that it's, it's going gangbusters, probably not. Um, but you see it and a lot more of it where you never saw it before. And, um, when we started that out, I had one person tell me that it will take 10 to 20 years. He said, you will almost need a generational change before you really start seeing this concept take off. Um, and he, he was, he was right. He was spot on the money. I mean, you have the guys that stayed with it, that, that liked it, that saw the benefits of it. You had some that dropped out, you know, after a, a while for various reasons. Um, and it's it's the ones that stay with it that the others watch and they may watch them for who knows how many years or their grandsons that farm with them or their sons that farm with them may be watching them that see, hey, that, you know, that's working for them. And um, they start out small and then gradually um, increase the amount that they that they do, but yeah, you you do see it scattered around. You see canola, used to never see canola, you know. Um, so, as the climate change and prices 
um, put more pressure on. Um, it's going to be more imperative to find more efficient and better ways to farm. I was reading that there's a, coming more aging aging producers and that more. That, more that's more. always been that way. That, I mean, even 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 in the in the eighties. Uh, in fact, I came across something when I was, you know, the average age, 58, 60, even back then. And it's like um, the younger guys have to, I mean, fewer are going into it. So the younger guys that are going into it, the amount of land that they have to farm, I mean, that just keeps, because there's fewer guys that are wanting to farm. Um, you're wanting the younger guys to do it, but they have to have so much in order to to make a living at it. You know, it's it's going to be interesting. You know, now my son worked for an oil company. Um, he was their cement engineer for a long time, but uh, when they asked him to move to Houston, he drew the line and said no, so they found him another job. So now he's flaring wells for carbon and methane emissions. That's what he does now for them. He farms this, the farm that my sister and I inherited from my, from my dad. And he also farms um, my mother's farm that she got from my dad in the divorce. So, uh, you know, he, that he, he's always wanted to farm now it's he's got some cows and he's got some cultivated land will he grow and pick up more farms after that i honestly don't know but he's always wanted to farm and he's got these two farms but that's not typical with most of the younger farmers i say younger farmers my son's 40 46 you know so he's a younger farmer so when you say cultivate is it mostly weed yeah, we tried canola on, on ours this year, but it, it the weather pin was not conducive. So. Well, I had read something about a Canadian Burris. Mm -hmm. Burris. Yeah, she had a demo farm for us during the North Canadian Project. Yeah. Yeah. yeah she's she's one of, took over from her husband. I don't know mm -hmm. the backstory for that, but yeah, it's becoming more common. Yeah, over time, um, you see that happening. Um, the the farmer, is, you know, the, the older farmer would pass away or or something, and either the kids would inherit it and sell the land, or the kids would inherit it and rent the land, or the widow would inherit it and rent the land. Uh, that was something you you saw as time as time went on. Absentee landowners, people that had inherited land. They were they were difficult because they just just send me the check, you know. Uh, now some of them would make a point to come and um, come into the district office, and when they would come back to take a look at the, you know, to view the farm on vacation, you know. Um, and I always I always appreciated that because that did show a certain level of interest, you know. Uh, some of them would come in and say, I'm, I'm thinking of considering renting to so-and-so. Is, is he a good farmer? Mm -hmm. You know, which kind of puts you between a rock and a hard place. But, uh, yeah, but a, a lot of them, it was just like, send me the check. Yeah. So we've talked a little bit about both jobs. So let's get into the association, the Oklahoma oh, Society. Oklahoma Association of Conservation Districts. Yeah, um, I was I was chosen, I guess, to participate in that, and and I really enjoyed it because um, there were things I had ideas for, um, kind of on the state level. I I wanted to maybe bring to the table, but unfortunately, I didn't get to serve very long. Um, my daughter got ill in her pregnancy, and and. Um, I was extremely worried about her, so I resigned that position so I could 
go down and stay with her and make sure she was okay and take care of my granddaughter during that time period. So I'm sorry I can't add much more on that, but, but that's basically it in a nutshell. I was very honored to serve for the short time I did. Yeah. And what's your sense these days after looking back 30 years on uh, transitioning to more women in leadership positions, both in districts, the state association, and NRCS? What, what have you seen transition-wise and where you think it's headed? I think women bring a lot to the table. They offer a different perspective. Um, I've kind of, I think women think out of the box a little easier sometimes than men do. Um, and it's, it's challenging sometimes to, I mean, my own, my own, and I'm not going to name which relative, but my own relatives are, are, guilty of, of this um, you can throw something out and it's it's an excellent idea and like if you're a woman giving this to a male and it's like you know that won't work or that won't go anywhere and then you can have the guy two seats down that gets it and repeat almost verbatim what you just said and the guy that said that won't work thinks it's the greatest thing he's ever heard. You know, and sometimes that's kind of difficult to, to sit there and sit on. But the, the point is, is to get that out there. Yeah. And, and it's, it's not important who gets the credit or, or who it came from. That it, the important thing is, is that if it's a good idea and it can go somewhere, and they accept it, then then you've achieved your your goal. So, um, yeah, women and women bring a different perspective to the table, and and in some in some cases, some of their uh, perspective might be from a different angle. It might be from a well, we need to do this conservation work because it ha can have potential health and you know health impacts or um, and I think that's going to become more important as climate change and, and different things um, impact us. I mean, when you look at the drought in the Southwest, I was reading an article on that the other day about how severe that drought was, and then they were talking about how the kids would wait to go out and frolic in the lawn sprinklers until after us, you know. And I'm thinking, you're in a drought. Why do you have lawn sprinklers? And of course, some of them have, uh, in the middle of Arizona, which is a desert anyway, um, some of them have started limiting the amount of time they can. But if, if we think we're immune to that kind of, of climate impact here, we need, we need to think, think again. So, for the next five years, what do you think you want to accomplish? Well, I'd like to look and see if we can't get some money for a local emphasis area. I'd like to keep the doors open um, here at the conservation district with uh, some money flow. Uh, just aid the producers like we always have through through what we can help them do because, you know, it's it's not cheap to go out and hire uh, dirt work and a contractor to uh, make a new waterway or uh, repair an old waterway or just fence a half a mile or more of fencing to con help to control grazing or drilling. None of that is cheap because the margins are so narrow uh, to produce anymore. Um, I think it becomes more and more important that, that we keep putting money into conservation work so that we, we can assist people with doing that. Um, because it's just like, like what I said, you know, uh, you let your natural resources go to hell, where, the, where are you going to be? You know, uh, they're not making much new soil these days. And 
erosion and stuff. I know I, I went to workshops where they showed how much how much topsoil we had around statehood. And then after the effects of, of cultivation and stuff and erosion, how much topsoil we have existing. And if you don't do certain conservation practices to maintain that, you can't grow crops where there's no topsoil. You know, and our population isn't getting any smaller. And the current war in Ukraine shows just how fragile our potential food supply chain could possibly be. And so if, if you reduce through urban sprawl and which, by the way, is generally always built on the best class one farmland, you know, because it's cheap to build on class one farmland, it's nice and flat, you know, and fertile. Um, if you keep covering that up with concrete and houses and and uh, you don't protect the, the more vulnerable aspects of the soil that we have left, um, will we have enough, you know, to feed everybody? And, and I like buying local, I like all the local farms, but um, I don't know, it's, I, I see some challenges down the road, probably past my lifetime, but that's, that's what you've got to look at if you're going to plan for the future. You've got to look 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the road and say, well, if, if this trend continues and this trend continues, where are we going to be at? Well, then you have to spend time te teaching, educating the elementary school level kids. Yeah, yeah. And we, I, we used to do an outdoor classroom every year um, out at American Horse Lake, and I would have a variety of people come in teaching all kinds of different stuff. Um, and you have to start, you have to start with those kids. And they do a district garden? Katie's working on a district community garden. Mm, cool. Yeah, yeah. So. How are you doing, Ben? Good. <laughs> Need to get up and stretch. I know this may not be, important to but I was reading that for the OCC me meetings you would stand, you would do the Pledge of Allegiance say the Pledge of Allegiance do they still do that and as far as I know they do I, think so. I just wondered if they with the changing climate oh, I no. figured that might not be done anymore no I, I, I don't know now we don't do it at board meetings yeah. did you at one time not that I'm aware of okay they can't read everything believe everything <laughs> I know that Stop Easter was in high school and in, in elementary school, I guess, maybe up to maybe the eighth grade, you'd say that every morning. Yeah, yeah. Or we did. Yeah, yeah we did too. I, you said that, and I was trying to think, when did we When did we stop I, in junior high or maybe something like, unless the first hour teacher. Probably in the 70s, early 70s is what I'm thinking, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I think I could still remember the word, but let me check through my, we've covered everything, I think, just about on my, on my list. I know on yours, Ben. I'm gonna defer to Debbie, because she's may have some other things that she would like to share. I think I've kind of circled around. And some of your workshops were quality urban stream workshops is what we yeah. you know, talked about that. Blue Sun. One of one of the things we did with the North Canadian project too was, um, I had Cheryl Cheadle come out and and we I would put together workshops and in different segments of the watershed for people that was interested in stream monitoring. So we had quite a few streams and a lot of those were like classes, like the teacher up at Canton monitored the stream up there with her class. The um, uh, biology professor at El Reno, and she's still monitoring, um, would take her class out and monitor Four Mile Creek. And then we had individuals scattered out with other creeks too that, that would do some monitoring. Do you do anything with pollinators and monarchs? That was a big push kind of after, after yeah. me, yeah. I mean, I'm sure that we would probably have 
something on it because I that was just beginning to come to the fore. Mm -hmm. And groundwater testing. That's yeah, we would do it. we would do groundwater testing. And does the does this district have issues with uh, wild hogs? Or old, or old yeah, um, I've I've went out one time to survey with the technician. When I mean, and this was before um, NRCS consolidated. And I had never seen one. This was on South Canadian River, and I was going down to hold the rod for him. Um, came across a place, and it, it looked like a thousand head of cattle had stampeded through yeah. there. And I said, what in the world? He goes, hogs. Mm, yeah. So they've rooted all this up. And um, now Katie could probably tell you more about hog damage and stuff I mean there's been several ways to try to control them one of the things we used to raffle off as a fundraiser for at the OACD annual meeting when I worked for the district was uh, we would raffle off a wild hog hunt and and uh, cookout and that was always really popular you know and because we had a board member at that time that would get us on people's places where they knew there was hogs and and take them hunting and then we feed them um, but that's not an effective as popular as that was that's not an effective hog control and there's been traps and you know all of this kind of stuff to try to get them cur curtailed but when you have something that breeds that quick and that many it's it's almost hard to get a handle on them yeah, it's several times a year, isn't it? Yeah. It's like 13 or 14 yeah. per litter. Yeah. 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 And red cedars, you mentioned earlier, that's always. Red always, cedars is, always, yeah, we do, in our, in our state cost share, um, that's one of the main things that people will come in. And I wish we could get a little bit more money for that program because, you know, they're limited to a maximum payment based on the amount of funding we can get. And we're always lucky with getting the full amount that we can get and sometimes additional if other districts don't use all their funds. Um, but when you've got 60 acres of cedar sitting out there that you need cut and you can only cut 15 or 20 acres of them because that's the maximum amount that your payment will cover it takes you know a number of, time, of years to to get the 60 acres taken care of um, so it'd be nice to see an increase in funding so that you could address more issues like that but um, yeah cedars are a huge issue and one of the things that that some landowners have noticed is is after cedars are removed creeks that and they noticed this in Dewey County too after that extreme wildfire they had because they have a lot of cedars out there and it burned up acres and acres and acres of cedars is you'll see some creeks come back to life and start running again once you get that those cedars removed and one of the things that we used to do in classrooms and other education deals and even in producer workshops and stuff is is if you take a plastic bag and you put it over the end of a cedar and tie it off and then you can do it on a deciduous tree too or bush or shrub or whatever and then you come back 24 hours later because it's hard to fathom the amount of groundwater that can be removed through evapotranspiration of a, of a tree or a, or a cedar and this is the most simplistic way to get through to people is just to wrap that plastic bag around the end, tie it off tight, and come back 24 hours later and you will be shocked sometimes by how much water is in that bag. And it's all been sucked up from that tree from, from what available groundwater is there. Yeah. And when you, you take that one little limb and all the water that's in that from that cedar and then you start looking at how many cedars you got out there and how many limbs and how tall it is, it, it gets through. Mm -hmm. 
lot to think about. Yeah. How do you keep up with all of the new, the new fangled things coming along down the pike and new programs and all that? How do you keep up with all I that? I depend on Katie and in okay. NRCS. Okay. To enlighten us, and then it's always interesting because I've I've always my old DC when we'd go to meetings and stuff, he finally got to where he would sit by me, and hold my arm down because I was always one of these people raising raising my hand and asking questions and and the board's pretty good they don't always roll their eyes but I mean I can I can kind of see um, some of the faces kind of tighten up a little bit when I start like if NRCS is here I have a lot of questions and stuff I can kind of see there so I, I try to keep it to a minimum but yeah I just, I'm still a question answer. But good questions help solve problems, don't they? Yeah. If, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully. Or bring it something to somebody's attention. So what, if you could think of a, a, the strangest question that someone may have asked you coming through the door regarding conservation or what you could help Well, I don't know about it. If it was the strangest question, probably... For me, one of the most humorous things that happened was some of this farmland was being sold um, and people were coming out from urban areas and purchasing it for weekend getaways and, you know, fishing, bringing, you know, coming out and fishing and stuff and, you know, pure, purely for recreational purposes. And I had one guy come through the door one time, sit down and, and he said, he said, I didn't know there was anything like that. He was an urban guy, you know, never wasn't raised on a farm, didn't have any ag background. And he said, I didn't know there was an office like this, you know, where where you could come in and they'll actually like help you do stuff, pay for it. And I said, Yeah. I said, Yeah. I said he said, Well, I just bought this farm and he gave me the legal description and stuff and and um, so I was talking to him about it and I was getting ready to go get the map to look at it with him and and uh, he said, man, he said, we are so looking forward to it. He said, it is the most fantastic place for wildlife. He said, it has got cedars all over it. <laughs> and I, well, I didn't say anything, so I went and got his map and came back and I sit down with him and I said, well, I said, the first thing is, is I, I know you're really thrilled about those cedars, but I said, that's not necessarily the best thing for wildlife or for the amount of water that you, you want. I think it had a pond on it. And, and um, it, his face, I mean, because he was literally beaming. He was so proud of purchasing this place that was so wonderful for wildlife that was eaten up absolutely with cedars. And um, so then I started talking to him and I always kept a lot of pamphlets in the office too on, on wildlife and different things like that. and, and um, I said, well, for one thing, I said, it's a monoculture. And I said, monocultures are not, never really beneficial for, um, you know, a diversity of wildlife. And I said, I said, you've probably got some native grasses under there that are being choked out, you know, that you might be able to come back. And I just tried to gently talk to him to, to try to lessen his trauma of what he had just paid for and what he was gonna to have to do now to get it to where he thought he had it to begin with and uh, loaded him up with pamphlets and stuff. And, and um, he he became a pretty good customer. And he so he came back. Yeah, yeah, he gradually removed the cedars and, and he became one of my pond participants too. Ooh. So, cool. yeah. yeah. You did a lot of education in your- I really your enjoyed job. putting the education together as, as I went around and and went to the, the trainings and found out about all the different things that you could do. Saw what other districts were doing. I know the first outdoor classroom I went down to observe to see how to do one was D. Serbers down at Grady County at Chickasha. She put on a great outdoor classroom. Um, and I ended up going around and teaching at a lot of outdoor classrooms because I had the OD or the WET, you know, uh, Project WET and the different things that, that I could do over time. And then the district in, in, uh, invested in a groundwater flow model too, uh, 
so that you could demonstrate what actually happens. Um, if you overproduce out of a well, you can actually draw pollutants in or uh, surface impacts. And you just did it by a, by a um, method, by a series of just dropping different dyes out and then you pump this to pull the water through the system to show how things could be dispersed through an aquifer or, or drawn up into a water well or, or whatever. And uh, so, so yeah, I, I really enjoyed the educational aspect of putting it together and inviting the people. So many good speakers. And I was, I was always paid it. Whenever I went to anything, I always tried to pay attention to the attention of the people. And some people have a very, very good content, but the delivery, you lose them. And so I always tried to pick people that the content was good, the delivery was excellent. Because it doesn't do any good. You can have the best speaker in the world come to talk to somebody. But if they're not going to listen because they zone out, uh, just because of the, the way it's being delivered, you're, you're spinning your wheels. And so over the years, I learned really excellent people with excellent content tent, whether they were uh, like Greg Scott with soils who could talk about anything anyway um, from grasses to you name it to uh, grazing specialists or, or no-tills specialists and stuff and also getting them out of the building and into the into the field also helps with that and feeding them doesn't hurt um, I did get irritated because I did have a cluster of producers that would come, eat, they'd show up about 15 minutes before lunch, they'd listen for 15 minutes, eat, and then they they didn't make it so obviously that, that they were rushing out the door, but I did have a, a few of those that came for the food because we didn't charge them for the food. I wanted them to come, you know. Um, and then they'd stay about 10 minutes after lunch and then they'd leave. You know? <laughs> so I just got to where I'd stand at the door going, leaving early again, are you? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got to go gather cattle or yeah, we got to go do this. <laughs> but there weren't very many of those. There weren't very many, but there were a few. Yeah, when we were setting that, we'll change the subject just a little bit. You, When you switched from the district office to OCC, you mentioned that benefits were better is that was that the pay was better. The pay was better. See, district employees a lot of times, um, if it's an election year, you might you might get a raise, which everybody's thankful for. Don't get me wrong, but um, through those intervening years, when you didn't get a cost of living raise or you didn't, pay, which district employees don't. You don't, and you don't get any raises by the legislature, they have to grant them, your insurance is still going up. So nine times out of 10, when you finally get a raise, it's just covering the cost of, of what your, your benefits have increased, but you're not ahead of the inflation game. You, you know, they hired me in at $5 an hour in 88. I made five dollars an hour driving tractor for my dad. You know, um, and I don't know how long it took me to. I I couldn't tell you exactly what I was making um, by the time I went to the work for the commission, but if you look at say increasing five dollars an hour by three percent in every election cycle, and sometimes it wasn't even 3%, that'll give you a rough idea of what I was making by the time I went to the commission. And so it, it's tough. So by the time you came on board, they were already had insurance benefits no, and stuff no. figured out. When well, I, she started in 88. I started yeah. in 88, and I think it was like three or six months it was, later. It was, yeah, it was a right in that period that yeah, yeah. she wouldn't have started without benefits, which was even yeah. tougher. Yeah. yeah. Um, and like I said, my, my husband and I divorced. So this job was such a blessing because it did keep a roof over our head and kept us fed. And I had insurance and retirement to look at. And um, 
I raised all three great kids. And my daughter's an RN, and like I said, my son uh, works for an oil company. My other son um, works at um, Tim Troll at Oparchi, and seven grandkids later, so. If one of them had come to you and said, I want to be an archaeologist, would you have said? I would have been, I would have said, you go for it. <laughs> you go for it. And I would have done everything. My daughter did uh, uh, graduate from OU uh, with a degree uh, in environmental science. And I, I told her at the time, I said, um, you do realize, don't you, that Jobs like mine in Oklahoma are few and far between. I said, you'll have to look at going out of state to work, like Chesapeake Bay Area or, you know, Louisiana or, you know, it'll be off. That's okay. That's fine, Mom. Well, in the interim, there towards the end before she graduated, she met a fella and uh, was serious about him. And uh, he wasn't interested in moving off to so she comes back, she comes back and she goes, I think I'm going to go back and get an RN degree. <laughs> and I said, she said, because I can't find a job in Oklahoma. I've looked and I said, I told you. And I said, well, sweetness, I said, go ahead and do that. But I said, my work is done. I said, if you want an RN degree, you're going to have to figure out how to do that. Because we had had this discussion. <laughs> You know, and I had even specifically mentioned that oh, you did an RN, you know, a four-year RN degree. No, nope. environmental science. But I encouraged her in that. I just told her the caveat, you know. Uh, so yeah, no, I would have told her. I just said go for it, you know. Did they all understand what you were doing, what your work was all? Here, yeah, I took them with me a lot. I mean, especially my daughter. There's a lot of pictures of me and her. Uh, with me. In, in fact, I, when I was going through stuff, I found one and she looked like she was about in the fifth grade and um, both of us are just the sweat and I've got a bill cap on and I look like I've been, so it was obviously some kind of field day or, or field workshop that we had been on um, that she, and she was just beaming and I was like, I'm ready to go home. But uh, yeah, I took them. I took them with me a lot, and um, of course, like like I said, my oldest one was always kind of interested in nature and, and water any, anyway. So, tractor. Yeah. yeah, tractor. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? No. I'm good. Mm -hmm. I never looked at your picture. Sure. That we might not know. I might not know to ask. Well, the only other thing, you know, like when we were talking about the consolidation of NRCS and everything. I, when I first went to work in ADA, there was over 600 NRCS employees back then. What, 680? It was pushing that you know, number, yes. Um, and I think by the, t by the time I retired, it was down to 200 and something, and something like now. that. And I, I would be curious to know what it is now. Um, you know, my my grandson, my oldest son, Christian, his son Condry. My maiden name was Condry. They named their firstborn Condry. Mm -hmm. My maiden name, so his name's Condry Carnot. Um, he is up at Alva, and he recently graduated with his bachelor's, and he's going back now and majoring in in ag and for a master's and. Um, I was talking to him and, and everything, and he's not sure exactly what area of ag he wants to concentrate on, whether it be soils or crop production or whatever. And he's he's working for a big farmer up there now too, plus going to school. Um, but I told him, I said, well, I said, you need to go into some NRCS district offices and talk to them about shadowing them or coming in and sitting down and visiting with them. And I said, um, I'll get you the name. I said, there's internships within RCS. I said, I'll, I'll get you the contact for that. And um, so that's what he's doing. He's he's looking at hopefully trying to get an internship. It's too late for this year, but he's hoping next year and um, looking at making contact with Nick Owen, the technician in at El Reno and 
going with him and doing some shadowing and stuff. So uh, it it goes on, cool. and I'm I'm very. I'm very pleased. Now, if he'll end up in, in that or if he'll go into crop consulting or something like that, who knows? But yeah. the point is, it it goes on. And my dad would be so pleased. Yeah. My dad would be so pleased. You, you know enough, you could sit down with him and spend many afternoons bringing him up to speed with what you do know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You've had to have learned technical knowledge, I mean, along the way, too. Yeah. I, I've learned, like I said, I've. I, I have lived being raised on a farm, riding tractors and all that. Um, my dad was a conventional farmer, you know. Um, he did the multiple tillages and stuff like that. Uh, but still, he he was always wanting to take care of it. He he was very diligent about that, even if it was rented land, which not all guys that rent land have that kind of ethic. Um, but he always wanted it to make sure that no, it wasn't eroding here, or, or no, you know, the pastures weren't raised too short. He was he was always very conscious of of how he wanted those places to be, and um, uh, I learned a lot from him. But I learned a lot here too. Hey, Lynn, anything else? Um. Oh, there's a few little things. I mean, we did storm drain marking with the Boy Scouts in, in different towns with the North Canadian Project, and mm -hmm. I had a I had a quarterly newsletter. I mean, not a whole lot, you know, just um, you mailed it out, mail mail out or email out. Your quarterly newsletter. It's like, I don't know how it is now, but back then, you know, most farmers did not, you know, and, and that was the big push back then. It's like, we'll do everything by computer applications and all they have to do. And I said, I don't know who you guys deal with. <laughs> but I said, I can't think of a single farmer that I deal with that's going to be that even maybe has a computer, let alone get online and fill out an application and forward it to you. You know, I said, they they do face to face stuff, you know, and maybe it's better now. Maybe they have their wives or their grandkids do it for them if, they, if, if that's still, you know, but yeah, that was a big push back then. And I told them, I said, <laughs> ain't going to happen, guys, you know. Um, Let's see. I guess I just basically just really want to hone in on that Will Rogers quote um, because, I, like I said, I put it at the bottom uh, of the stationery to make sure that, and I, I don't think it's something that should be forgotten. And, and one of the concerns is as time continues to go on, the connection with where our food comes from, the connection on what it takes to get our food to our table, whether it be from growing to transportation to whatever, um, the disconnect with each generation just, in, in, in reality, I think it only takes one generation to make that disconnect where people do not understand what it takes to grow food. Um, it just happens, you know, you just, go out with a tractor and a drill and you, you plant it and it comes up. Doesn't happen, you know. Um, there's so many things to fight from from the cost of doing it to begin with to insects, weather, um, hoping that you'll even get it to the, to the great, you know, the co-op or the elevator. Uh, it's not a done deal. And People have got to understand that you have to invest in the preservation of those resources in order to keep that bounty coming, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I think it's harder to convince them with each generation that goes 
that goes on with because I mean how do you how do you get an, an entire um, congressional you know out on one place and try to explain all that to them in 15 minutes which is probably all that they're wanting to to spend it takes a continuous continuous effort um, of trying to make them understand the importance of investing. It's investing in America's future, no different than, than the current push to invest in improving America's technology and capabilities. No different. We have two, two questions, and we have to talk about COVID. How has COVID impacted what you do from this office? Um, or has it? Well, I don't think. That might be better directed to Katie. I told Katie has small children, and I told you know. I think there was. I know I went home and hibernated until I could get my shot, because and the and the main reason with that is because my daughter's health situation at the time, and she did not want to get the any the shot or anything, um, because she didn't know how it might potentially impact her health situation. And she was pregnant, which I don't blame her. Uh, but yeah, there's not a huge amount of traffic in and out of here. And I think I think people just kind of stood down even to begin with. And I know some, some people, NRCS had a remote work order for a long time. So it, it's not like that there was a lot getting back in the swing of things it's you know i don't think that's going to be a problem because as soon as you make an announcement of, of cost share available or whatever yeah they'll be back and then my last question is how do you want to be remembered how do you want people to remember oh any gosh or not? oh gosh i would hope that people would remember that I was always willing to help, always, always tried to do what was best for um, the district and the producers and for conservation in general. Um, and that I wasn't bad to get along with. <laughs> okay. I think mission accomplished. <laughs> Well, we appreciate you sharing with us today. Well, and for welcome. taking care of that six inch level of soil, layer of soil. Yeah. That's right, isn't it? Six inches, isn't that what? Well, yeah, I think it varies according to, to different soil types as to what's left now, but but it's, yeah, it's, uh, and, and so many people don't understand that. And I was trying to explain it to somebody one day, and I said, well, why do you think they're out there cleaning your bar ditches out? because they won't run water anymore. Every bit of that soil came off of your field and it's in the ditch yep. and they're loading it up in a dump truck and they're hauling it off. Yep. And it was like, ding. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I even had one guy and I, I wish I could remember names better. There was one guy that whenever he'd see him doing that, he'd make him put it back out on oh, the field. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you, Debbie. You're welcome. You look great. Okay. Back again. Back again. Um, as part of the North Canadian River Project, we were doing a lot of practices that would sequester carbon. And so I was kind of interested in trying to find, uh, pursue that and find somebody that might be willing to cost share uh, to add another incentive payment to producers to maybe convert to no till or or um, uh, put some cropland to grass that was that was highly erodible, or if they were interested in extending as part of their rotational grazing plan. And um, we found, um, I think it was Anadarko um, Western Farmers Cooperative was interested in contributing money to that. And so that was another component of the North Canadian uh, River Project that we were able to include uh, as an incentive for
for participation was this carbon sequestration payment that Western Farmers um, funded. And I think they did over um, <clears throat> over 3 million uh, metric tons. I had that at one point. Hmm. Um, 3 million 193 metric tons of carbon because they had to they did special training for people to go out and, and do that assessment to assess how many tons of carbon was being sequestered and everything. Um, and uh, so at the end of the day, for everybody that applied for that program, and we might have had more tons of carbon sequestered um, if everybody had wanted to participate in that end of it. Um, but the ones that did and signed up for that carbon sequestration payment, there was over three million metric tons of carbon that was sequestered through through those practices. And so uh, that was kind of a unique thing at that at that time when that project was going. We were just starting to hear about the importance of sequestering carbon um, in order to offset climate change. So can you tell for people who might not know what that is? <clears throat> carbon sequestration. Carbon sequestration, that's where during uh, various conservation practices will will lock carbon in the soil so that it doesn't emit uh, carbon dioxide to break down uh, because of how of what you're doing into the atmosphere. The other thing that the district um, did when they were um, in the early days was there was a there was. Daryl Putman, the conservation technician, told me told me this story um, about this, some of the history of the Central North Canadian River um, Conservation District. That in the 30s, when they were trying to get so much of the cropland that wasn't suitable for farming uh, planted back to grass, either because it was highly erodible or it was so degraded through wind erosion or different things that they they needed to get it established into uh, into grasslands, they were having problems with the drills. They weren't getting good stands of grass uh, with the drills they had available at the time. Grass seed can be a very finicky little thing and it's, some seeds are very, very tiny. So in order to get it calibrated just right, some grasses don't like to be put very deep. Some grasses, um, there's just a, a different range of conditions for different grasses when, you, when you're sowing them. And there was a guy here in, in Geary named James Carr, Daryl told me, that was kind of a really avid tinkerer. Now, Daryl told me he worked for the district. I couldn't find anything in the minutes about uh, him working. I, I know I listened to an oral history that he gave that's, that's with the Oklahoma History Center. Um, and I kind of was under the impression that he was listening to his interview, not that he hit on it very much um, uh, as to what he actually did, but he he liked things mechanical. And he came up with uh, a drill that would provide more success in sowing these grass seeds after, after he <clears throat> made his modifications to it. And Darren told me that they shipped these drills out far and wide after he got the the mechanics of it perfected and they all came out from Geary, Oklahoma here to help in the conservation effort. I couldn't find it like I'm saying I couldn't find anything in the minutes to verify that but but Daryl was born and raised here and and knew Mr. Kerr so um, I imagine that he knew exactly knew what he was talking about. And then there was a Hugh Bennett connection. Hugh Hammond Bennett visited here. We have pictures of him uh, visiting the Central North Canadian <coughs> River Conservation District and taking in the district bar. Yeah, a lot of a lot of good history here. Well, and one most obvious question: How did they come up with the name? It's a long name for the Central North Canadian River Conservation District. I have never gotten a good. Uh, answer for that, uh, I guess, because it's it was centrally no located. I mean, it was like 
practically right on the office was practically in the CCC camp was practically right on the line for Canadian and Blaine County. So that made it kind of central. This is my own theory, which makes it more central to both counties, like located in center. And it was close to the North Canadian. <laughs> so that's my best guess for how they came up with Central North Canadian River Conservation District. It's like it is still here and today. And it's still here today. And serve the soil and the soil will serve you. Yep. <laughs> and America's resources will not last longer, or America's good fortune will not last longer than her natural resources. Well, save thanks. the soil and the soil will save you. Well, thank you very much. Thank again. you. Again. Thank you. Thank you.